tables this morning. How many want more of Jesus? Okay, let's don't leave here this morning until we grasp something bigger and better. Yes. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. All right. You're just praising God. I see that hand praising God. Here we are, February 20th. John Bell, it's always good to see you. Bless you. Uh, February 23rd. Here we are. We are waiting on the Lord. We're waiting on God's timing. Um, I know the Lord's speaking to us. And I also know the enemy of our soul is railing against the good things. He will always do that. We're, when you think about this, only two months removed from Christmas Island. Christmas Island went down fast this year, trees and all. And so it's not a lingering thought. It got folded up and, you know, you transition. We're only two months removed. That was a whole lot of testimony. That was a whole lot of community outreach. I have friends, some of you do also around the world. I know all through Latin America, my Argentine friends, they posted to that. There's people in Guatemala. There's people in, down in the Patagonia. There's people all over the place saw that stuff. Write me in Spanish something. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amazing. It's amazing. It, it's, that, it's that message that one little center, one church, is able to translate. And I want you to understand that. It's not that the gospel doesn't go around the world, but we have effectively done something as a ministry that has gone I don't know how far. And it all happened at this address. Well, that's funny because this morning when I was praying, God was showing me this picture of a skipping stone going over clear, smooth water and causing this ripple effect. And it was like four or five different skips. And as you were saying that, he said, that's Christmas Island. Amen. So here we are, two months removed. We're in this place. We went sovereign. And, and some of the things I'm going to say today, you may remember, you may have heard me say, but please understand, we're in a great place, but it's almost a desert. In other words, the pastor's telling you, we're in a great place. We went sovereign, and here we are now. We're waiting. This is our year. We know that sovereignty was a big key for us, and financially, and we'll have our first business meeting coming up here in March as an independent sovereign church. But some of you may say, so where are we going? In other words, we have this hope and desire for God to reveal himself, and we know we're going, but we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a point of preparation. Some would say, well, give me a picture of a building or give me a, some teaching aid so I can get a hold of where we're going. And I've thought about that. And even though I could translate that and probably communicate that or color it out, and even though it's part of my hopes and my desires and dreams, and many of us here, I can't really paint a picture of it yet because God hasn't released me from this place. It's kind of like a starting line. You ever watch motorcycle races? I used to race uh, motorcycles as a kid. The motocross tracks have these rails that come up like this, and the bike pushes against the rail. And how they start the race is, and, and the same thing with a horse race. A horse race, the rail opens up, these drop down, and they jump out. You try to go through that gate before it drops. To anticipate it, you typically crash. Horses pretty much have the timing. It's the same thing with a horse race. They got the gate there and the horses are ready and the jockeys are ready and it's not until that gate opens that that horse can bust out of there. Some horses have tried to bust out of there and get all tangled up. They know there's a race. How many know there's a race coming? We know we're going somewheres. Some of us say, well, I'm going to Google it. Give me the address. Well, we know the address is all about Jesus and it's all about Christ and it's all about the Holy Spirit and it's all about our future. But I don't know that I can Google it right this second. Does that make sense? So it's an amazing place we're at. Here's what I know. I am affirming, and I, I, I confess this to you. I'm already out of script, so here we go. I confess this to you that my Jesus, who is a Jesus of salvation and doctrinally a God that heals and provider and some other things, is now all up on the same plane. In other words, Paul said this in Colossians, for in him, speaking of Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in Hebrews also, the right author of Hebrews says about Jesus, He's the radiance of His glory, God's glory, and the exact representation. Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. In this place, where, right where we are, this 23 in me, this Genesis 28 place, where we're just, we're in transition to another place, 
Jacob didn't know what Laban's household was going to be like or how he was going to connect or whatever, but he knew he was going that way. We know we're going that way, but we're in this place and God has us in this thing. We just come out of this fast. So here we are in this place. I want to Google it as a pastor. Man, I need to lead. I want to Google it. But God has me in this thing. Because why? Because God's doing something about the GPS in me so that I get the right address when I punch it in. Here's what we know about Jesus. We saw this at the 23 and Me. Of course, we have the narrative message of Christmas, and we get that, and we do that well here. If, if you were in Luke, and we're going to go to some scriptures in just a minute, you know, you, you see the whole narrative, the birth, the Christmas thing, we got it, we got it all figured out. Mary, you know, I'm in 23 and Me for eternity. We get that. We get the child being born. We get that circumcision eight days. We get this 40-day Mary and Joseph coming into the temple to to do what Leviticus told him to do about the firstborn son and so on and so forth. And then we see Jesus at age 12 and then we have these 18 silent years. And then we know from the Gospels that Jesus enters into his ministry when he's around 30 years old. This Jesus that's entering into this ministry, and I, I confess this to you as a pastor, you can, you can come to church and believe in salvation and the Word and the worship and the Spirit of God but doctrinally, doctrinally, I had separated in my mind, not doubtfully, but doctrinally, kind of the God that was and the God that is. And subconsciously, the God that is is the one that you can see and measure and, and judge. We have an annual minister's report we fill out every year. How many baptisms? How many salvations? How many baptisms in the Holy Spirit? That's the God that is because it's measurable. And so you kind of get so locked into that that the doctrinal God who is Adonai, who is Yahweh, Lord Jehovah, who is Jehovah Nessi, the Lord, my banner, who is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. All of the fullness of the essence that was in Jesus, all of those attributes are kind of Old Testament, New Testament. And I tell you one thing about this revelation right now, my God is all in all and all in all. There is no Jesus is and Jesus was or can or will, maybe, conditionally, I bring, when I come to church these days in this certain place where we are right now, I come here with an anticipation for my eye to be healed. Lord, I'm going to pray for my eye right now in the name of Jesus. Let me be the PowerPoint today. Heal this eye in the name of Jesus. Lord, I want to see right now in the name of Jesus. I want to see. I want to see. You healed blind eyes. That's the God that is now, right now, my healer in Jesus' name. Now, I can't see. And I've used this demonstration. Hang on to this. It doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't heal because the scriptures reveal our God. Well, then it must not be my timing. Well, God must want me to be blind. No, stop. Just stop. God is. My God can. I came here to reflect all that Jesus is doing in my life, and I'm here anticipating. Are you with me? It's different. I truly, genuinely have a belief in my spirit that when I come into this building right now, in this place, where we're going, that I have the fullness of the kingdom of heaven that's at hand, and, and, and I can say this, Father, your kingdom come, your will be done now on earth. What is your will? There's no blind eyes in heaven. That's not witchcraft. I'm not being gullible. I'm just telling you, my Jesus is exactly what Scripture puts him to be. Are you with me? So I'm at this point now. It's like, okay, so where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? And I'm in this holding thing. And I want you to think with me a little bit. So we know from Scriptures that Jesus, go to Matthew 28 in your Bibles. Make this a legal Bible study. Turn to Matthew 28. We know that Jesus started His ministry around 30 years old. Scriptures. We know the whole Christmas narrative, the eight days circumcision, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Leviticus consecration in the temple, Anna, Simeon. And then the next story we have, Jesus is 12. At 12 years old, they started studying to become manhood. 13, they transitioned in. But here's what Jesus said. I want to go there in a minute. Here's what Jesus said. After it was all said and done, Jesus said this, Matthew 28, 18, the Great Commission. You're familiar with this, but let's just read it. Jesus came up and spoke to them. Who's of them? The disciples. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, we talked about this briefly, but remember, as the Son of Man, Emmanuel, God with us in flesh, the second Adam, authority was granted. As the Son of Man, as the Son of God, he never lost his authority. Now, that's just a concept. How you can wrap your head around that, okay, you do it by faith. I don't know that you can equate that, but he was fully God and fully man. 
But Jesus right here is speaking to, I believe, according to Pastor George, the human side, the second Adam. And he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In other words, I came and I modeled for you what humanity can do and should be doing, that was doing in the garden, that lost because, that, that they lost, or, or literally Adam and Eve gave away to the enemy because of the fall. But I've demonstrated it for you, and I'm going to take this sinless life. He was, sinned, he was tempted just as we are in every way, yet he didn't sin. Now, we're not perfect, but who would agree with me? Jesus is our model. You want a role model, it's not some rock and roll band. It's not our president. It's not your pastor. It's Jesus. When I grow up, I want to be more like Jesus. That's my Georgism. When I grow up, I want to be more like Jesus. That has been my quest. More like Jesus, more like Jesus. So where do you go? You go to the scriptures. So here's what Jesus says, verse 19. Go therefore, in other words, because of what I just said, all authority has been given to me, humanity, and what I give, I give to you. Greater things you will even do. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all, we talked about this, all that I commanded you, all, everything, all things, not the God that was, God that is, my all in all in all, teach them everything, all the gospel, all the gospel. And remember and understand this, I'm with you, man. I will be with you. As you teach everything, I will be with you. I can't do anything now but anticipate God moving mightily in this service. And not some God that is God that was, but God totally, Emmanuel, God with us. Are you with me? Yes. It's different. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to absolutely believe it. I have come here to reflect the glory of God this morning. I seem a little distracted, but I'm trying to communicate. I'm just trying to think through this process in my mind. Okay? Just trying to think through this whole process. All right? Now, who turned in their Bibles to Matthew 28? Raise your hands. I'm going to give you a big kiss on the lips like honey. Never mind. Catch me later. I was going to say, but not the women, but then... The men? No. Nobody. <laughs> Go to Mark 16. Let me fill in the rest of the blanks. We hear a lot about Matthew, but here's the rest of this commandment, great commandment, commission. Now watch this, please. Watch this. Mark 16, verse 14 through 20. It says, Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves, and they were not, and they were reclining at the table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. He had appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. There was all kinds of stuff going on, dead people coming out of tombs and stuff. And here's the eleven, and they're cowering. Understand this, okay? I don't mind standing before you and being very humble and telling you that my God who is, was quasi-doctrinal as a God who was, I don't have a problem with that at all because I'm going to be genuine before you. Okay? Look, this transformation, this Romans dynamic of being transformed by the renewing of your mind. I've said this, I think, last week before. There are seasons where when you bring your acceptable will before the Lord and you're praying and you're seeking, there's a transformation that is kind of accelerated over just the daily grind. In other words, if you just read one verse a day, and didn't do anything about it, you'd glean something from the Word of God. But by prayer, and by fasting, and by presenting and believing, there's this renewal thing that's kind of on a fast track a little bit. I would just say this, I'm being renewed. And there are others of you. We had talked about uh, Paula preaching today, and, and the Lord's given us a word of knowledge, and we're going to do some things together coming up in March. But I went to her and I said, hey, do you, do you want to just, you know, I'm humble enough, Paula, you're bubbling, you're just full, you're just rolling. She's a pastor. Do you want to preach today? That's exactly what I said. And I gave her that option. I have a word that's burning in me, but I'm humble enough to tell you, I want to hear from God. And if she has it, I was going to let her just run. But we felt like we needed to pray and fast on what God is saying. Okay? She has a very prophetic gift. It's an amazing combination of things that are going on in this church. There's a hunger. There's a renewal. There's an acceleration that's happening here that is amazing, church. It's amazing. This is a good place to be. Mm -hmm. I'm biased. 
I'm scripturally biased. This is a good place. Look at what he said. After he appeared to the eleven, and he reproached them for their what? Unbelief and hardness of heart because they not believed. How can you move? It's just like the, the feeding of the 5,000. How could you be a part of that supernatural event, cross the lake, and then flip out, freaking, that you're going to die when Jesus had you on, under authority to cross over? This is it. We roll through times. We roll through seasons. Sometimes we're up, we're rolling. And other times we, we understand the mind is the gateway to the supernatural. It's also the gateway for the taunting and trash talk of the enemy. So what's happening here? Jesus has hit the cross. These guys are cowering in the room. Maybe it wasn't true. Maybe he is dead. Maybe this. Oh, some of the guys said, some of the women said, oh, them dang women. Some of the women said they saw him at the tomb. Ooh, that ain't happening. We saw him hanging, dying. So Jesus comes and he reproaches him. Literally, that word reproach means he put the teeth to him. <laughs> What's happening? Demonstration right here. You, I said the mind is the gateway to the supernatural and the gateway for demonic strongholds. Right here, the enemy's going, didn't happen. You saw him dead. You saw him dead. You saw him dead with your eyes. You saw him dead on the cross. You saw him throw him in that tomb. He's in the tomb. You saw the stone rolled up there, and here they are. Well, gosh. I don't worry about the event. I always worry about the day after. I normally lay pretty low on Mondays especially after great Sundays. Teresa's learned to just let the guy go. Because it's one of those days where when you feel the anointing and you preach, maybe you felt this, maybe you haven't, but there's a pulpit anointing, you pour it out there, you pour your heart out, and then we come back for rooted for two hours in the afternoon for rooted. And the time I get home, put my feet up, it is so good on Monday morning. If I ever have a headache, it'll be on Monday mornings. If my feet ever hurt, it's on a Monday morning. If I get up and I just can't figure out what I want, I wear, and Teresa will say, what are you doing today? And I'll, it almost makes me mad. I don't know. Leave me alone. It's amazing. You know what hardness of heart is? The heart, in effect, is the whole person in all of his or her distinctive human activity, thinking, planning, willing, feeling, worshiping, socially interacting being. In other words, their hardness of heart was not so much that they stopped doing something, but more that they started to do something. Disbelief. See, you can do, do, do. You can have more programs. You can do this. We believe Wednesday nights come back. You can start doing a lot of stuff. It's not about the doing. It's about this. <laughs> Look at verse 15. Oh, back up. <laughs> God is so good. God is so good. My testimony is this. You know, I, feel, I don't feel sorry for this service. You guys normally get this condensed like, and then the next service has to listen to the trees. You know what I'm saying? But it's all good. It's all good. My testimony is this, I am bringing more of my Romans chapter 12, verse 1, acceptable to God right now. And because I'm bringing more of us acceptable, my acceptable to God, that was kind of my key word last Sunday, because I'm doing more of that right now, there's, there's a greater transformation that's happening. All right, so let me pull this together for you. <laughs> what am I posturing myself for? That's the ticket. I want you to turn into your Bibles to Scripture I alluded to a minute ago, and that was uh, <laughs> hang on Luke chapter two, verse 41. Go there in your Bibles. I'll close with this right here. OK? Somebody say, amen. amen. Look in the natural, I know what I'm praying for. I'm praying for healing, growth, revival. Come on. Anointing, the future of our church, spiritual, the future of our church, building-wise, physical, I'm praying for all that stuff. But I really can't color the picture right this second, okay? I've always said this, one of my isms, as long as you keep doing the last thing you know God told you to do, you're going to be okay. As long as you keep doing the last thing you know God told you to do and didn't untell you to do, you're okay. He'll change it. He'll do something different. Now, outside of when I was ordained and, and they laid hands on me and they said, according to 2 Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Outside of that, I know God said, 
wait. So here we are. We're waiting. We're hanging. We're in this place. Some of you might think, well, that's good for you. You're the pastor. I mean, I'm not. So I'm not sure what I'm waiting on or for, right? Now, if you look at this, Luke chapter 2, verse 41, look in there in your Bibles, no PowerPoint. Here we have this. So we have the narrative of the, of the we got all that. We got Christmas. We did that. We got that. Okay, I preached, I've been doing this for 28 years. I preached all over the whole gospel there, Anna, Simeon, the whole thing, eight days, 40 days, up and down, round and round in the temple. And then you have this narrative here about Jesus at 12 years old. Now watch this, okay, and I'm going to close with this. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, who's he? When Jesus became 12, at 12, he was entering into his manhood. So he was going to start being schooled, built up, age 13. He would operate under the same rules as a young male adult. They went up according to the custom of the feast. And as they were turning, returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it. Verse 44. But supposed him to be in the caravan. And it went a day's journey. And they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. Where's Jesus? I thought he was with you. No, I thought he was with you. Verse 45. When they didn't find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. In other words, when he wasn't with them in their travels, they went back to where he was. How many of you lost your car keys? Everybody's lost your car keys. And your wife or husband says, well, where did you have them last? I'll leave it right there, okay? So they went back to where they had him last to find the keys. All right. And after three days, verse 46, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening and asking him questions. Verse 47, key verse. By the way, you have permission to write in your phone, write, write in your phones, write in your Bibles. And all who heard him say were amazed, were amazed. And under and his, at his understanding and his awareness. Jesus is in the temple. He's entering into his instructive part of his life as a young man to understand the law, the prophets, to become a fully recognized Jewish man. Or adult and he's reasoning with the scriptures there's a lot of argument out there about whether Jesus actually knew he was or wasn't as he grew in other words as a baby when he was born took his first breath did he know he was God was there a cognitive or did he identify with humanity to the point to where it came along as a revelation we don't even have to go there it doesn't matter it's, in, it's irrelevant but here's the point What's Jesus doing? Jesus is preparing himself for something that's coming, whether he knows it or not. He's preparing himself to the point where he waited in the temple. It's time to go. Let's go. Wait a minute. Everybody's leaving. Hang on a minute. We're in a certain place right here. I'm in the temple. I got to ask some questions and I got to say some things. We're in a certain place right now. Look, if you want to know the will of God. Just go to the Word of God. And I believe there's a special Rhema word right here, Rhema word for us today. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, verse 6, Son, why have you treated us this way? It's easy, even with Mary, after everything she knew, to say to Jesus, What are you being disobedient? Why did you do that? Wait a minute. An angel came to you and said, that's God, Emmanuel, God with us, girl. And you're telling God, what are you doing? <laughs> Moms will do that. Right now, we're in this place and we're like, God, what are you doing? It's okay to question. Mary did it to Jesus. She said, what? why have you treated, uh oh, victimization right here. Why have you treated me like that? Behold your father and I, behold, young man, behold, 
Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, look at what he said. Why is it that you are looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? In other words, with the revelation that you have, didn't you know that I would have to be... Let me, let me, let me take this down the way I see it, okay? I'm not being doctrinal. This is according to George. Didn't you understand I have to prepare myself for something that's coming? I don't have any time to waste. I got to get into the Word. I got to ask questions. I got to figure out what's going on. I got to give you my opinion. We got to glean. I got to go. I got to grow. Where are you going, son? Not sure that anybody really knew about how that was all going to work out. You can have your opinions. I'll have mine. But he was preparing himself. In other words, at the very least, Jesus knew what the will of God was. But he had to one day become the will of God. And I've said it before. It wasn't until the garden when he said, Father, if this cup can pass from me, that cross thing's coming. If there's any other way, let's do that. But not my will, but thy will be done. Right? That's what he said. Jesus transitioned as the second Adam, knowing the will of God at whatever age, to becoming the will of God. We're in a place right now of knowing the will of God. We believe God has planted a sovereign independent church. We believe we're going somewhere. We believe the Spirit of God is here. There's a transformation happening. We're in a place right now of waiting, preparing ourselves for the will of God. Well, what does it look like? I'm not sure what, I, what it looks like, but I can tell you what I know the parameters are of that, right? So, let's finish this out. They didn't understand the statement he had made to them. Verse 51, And they went down with them, watch this, and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. You want to learn something from the life of Jesus? Now you have 18 silent years. I've been to Israel twice. Oh, this is where Jesus attended the, the synagogue. This is where Jesus did this. This is likely where Jesus did this. What was he doing? No one knows. There's some extra biblical writings about Jesus. You know, he made little clay birds. <laughs> you know, all this stuff. Time out. Time out. If you want to go there, okay. But I'm going to stick with this. But here's what something, here, here's what my Bible is saying without saying it. Okay? The Bible has given us everything. Just as we would look at Jesus, our healer, and kind of subtract that to be indoctrinal, here we have these 18 silent years, like, oh, okay, 18 silent years. Whoop! Let's get on. Let's rodeo. Let's get to the party. Let's get into that baptism by John. Let's do this, okay? 18 silent years of what? Preparing himself to become the will of God. Boom. I'll tell you what God's saying to me right now in my somewhat silence, I'm preparing this church, and I believe this is a word from God, to become the will of God in Maytown, whatever that looks like, and God's going to reveal it. you got to get a hold of this. See, by the Bible literally giving us 18 silent years, the implication from silence is this. Jesus prepared himself and was in submission, submission to those in authority over him. This is not a Lordship message. I'll tell you what this message is all about. Verse 52, Jesus kept increasing. He grew. He kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. You know what that says to us today, to me, in summary? It means two things. Jesus was loving God perfectly to the best of his ability and he was loving his neighbor as himself in preparation, knowing the will of God to become the will of God at Calvary. I believe right now, we may not know, one of these days you're going to come in here, be a big picture of a building up here, what we're going to do, and yada, yada, yada. But right now, it's like ho-hum. No, not ho-hum. These are not the silent years. These are the precious silent times where the Spirit of God is speaking prophetically, and everyone should be preparing themselves, faithful to church, faithful to Bible study. This rooted program, our, our rooted experience we are in, it's developing seven rhythms of God, reading our Bibles, praying to God, not minimizing Jesus. This is, this is the time right now to get a hold of the fullness of God. Because, man, when that color book and them crayons come, somebody start coloring. Are you with me? When it comes, sit on down with your magenta. 
Never could figure out what color that was. Sit on down with your pink. Start coloring. Come on, somebody. Start coloring. Start coloring. All right. All right. Now, final thoughts, final words. I'm a little over, but it's okay. This Greek word translated increased, where he increased, in, he, he kept increasing, increased in wisdom and stature. It literally means a pioneer hewing down trees and brushwood for the, to, to clear a path for an advancing army. Oh my gosh. Jesus was just clearing the brush to advance. You know what we're doing right now? Get that into your souls. Get that into your spirit. We're just clearing the brush right now for Maytown. We are clearing the brush for this church. We are clearing the brush for this church. <coughs> To believe, say, and experience. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I just thank you so much, Jesus. I just thank you so much, Father. I just thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, those silent years are really speaking loudly into my spirit. Because the Word of God, which is living and active, gives me enough information to understand. Knowing the will of God isn't enough. Preparation is all in all in all. And the Word of God is telling us, Jesus, continue to grow, continue to grow, continue to grow. Right now we are continuing to grow. Continuing to grow. Lord, I also know just as the mind is a gateway to the supernatural, the enemy want, wants to come and trash talk and tear us down and divide us and split us. I pray against that. I pray for good discussion. I pray for differing opinions. But I pray for that in love. Because the steel sharpens steel and, and iron, God, that we would just we would be the truly devoted church of the living God on earth as it is in heaven here at Maytown. I'm excited about becoming a greater portion of the will of God as I move forward. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you get what I'm saying? You get it? Time to keep moving. Everybody has a part. Everybody's going to get a crayon. You may get two crayons if you're really good. We're a part of something supernatural. I said this this morning in another circle. If the seated president wins, it's going to get worse. If the seated president loses and a different philosophy comes in to our seated government, it's going to get worse. Either way, it's going to get worse because it's going to aggravate the other side. Either way, because it's so polarized. Are you with me? It's time to advance. It's time to clear a brush. I don't know why I'm doing this like a sickle. I've never swung a sickle in my life, man. For me, it's like... <laughs> How many love Jesus? Come on, let's just stand and raise our hands. Can we do it? Let's just stand and raise our hands to the Lord as we get out of here. Father, oh, in the name of Jesus, we just stand before you in awe. Somebody stand in awe with me. We stand before you in awe, God, of what you're doing, what you're saying, and who you are. We just stand before you. We lift these hands as banners unto you. It's a release of our heart, soul, mind, and strength unto you, Lord. And it's a banner unto the heavens that says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Father, we're saying, use me, use us. Use us in your kingdom, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.